Hello and welcome to the Global Wire Conversations. My name is Ralph Scherlammer and today we'll be talking to Professor Stephen B. Smith. Stephen Smith is the Alfred Coase Professor of Political Science at Yale University. His research topics deal with the question of modernity, Spinoza, Leo Strauss and other philosophers of the modern era. His most recent books, books have been Reading Leo Strauss and Modernity and Its Discontents. It's especially the latter two works we will be discussing today. What is it that makes modernity special and something that you'll align out particularly in your book? What is a threat to, to modernity or kind of what is the, the, the inherent self-destructive inner tendencies that modernity has? Well, the book takes a particular slant on modernity, I would say. It begins with the idea that modernity, at least as I define it, focuses on the creation of a certain kind of, of human being, a certain kind of human character that I, I call the bourgeois. And that, I argue, is central to the modern project, uh, this idea of the bourgeois individual, obviously a term uh, that's more frequently associated with Marx and Marxism. I, I mean, I mean it somewhat differently uh, from Marx. You know, the bourgeois, the the owner of the means of production. But for me, I think in a more capacious way, the bourgeois is represents the emergence of what we might think of as sort of the free and responsible individual. Uh, an individual who is liberated from the ties of guild, of religious order, of family, of locality, and is free to make their own way in life, to be to pursue life as a kind of adventure with no necessary, necess necessary goal or purpose, but through the act of self-creation. And, you know, that was an idea that begins to take root in the 16th and 17th century. It gets lots of different formulations in political theory and literature and theology. Uh, and to understand the discontents with modernity, this is kind of a long way around to get to your question. To understand the discontents with modernity is to understand the discontents with this conception of, of the individual and how to and an individual way of life. Uh, in many ways, we take that view as a very admirable one, a noble one, to be able to uh, achieve something on your own, to make, to be a kind of self-made person, to write, write your own script, so to speak. But also that idea came to be seen as alienating, as deracinated, as atomistic, as all of the things that, uh, uh, what Tocqueville spoke of when he spoke of about a kind of restless individualism, which was not a, he used, he used the word enquietude for this, kind of rest, rest, continual restlessness, a dissatisfaction, uh, unable to find your pl a place in the world. And so many of the admirable characteristics became in a way flipped around uh, what was seen as uh, a sign of uh, Kind of individual freedom and self-expression became symptoms of alienation and uh, lack of uh, lack of rootedness and lack of uh, having a real place in the world, and so the discontents grew out of this idea of the um, of the self, the kind of individual and disconnected self, who is so has been so central to our politics, our literature, and our philosophy. So that's a very broad, uh, broad kind of statement of the thesis of my book. Uh, maybe we can talk about it a bit more specifically too. Absolutely. I think you, you pushed that conversation yeah. directly in the, in, the, in, the, in the right direction. Mm -hmm. If we think, for example, starting with Hobbes, do you think it would be a fair mm -hmm. assessment to say that kind of this 16th, 17th century thinking was the, the birth of philosophical and also political individualism? Or do you think that this would be an overstatement? Uh, what, what is the statement again? I'm sorry. The, the, a little bit of difficulty hearing. Sorry, that, that with, with, uh, with, with Hobbes and, and the, the kind of philosophy that emerges around Hobbes, that this is the beginning of political and, and uh, philosophical individualism. 
Hobbes, Hobbes is certainly the one who gives the most powerful uh, political expression to this, to this individualism and, the, and the, in many ways the problems that it, it creates, a absolutely. Uh, the idea, of all of the later Hobbesian ideas, famous ideas about sovereignty and authority of law uh, and the like all, are all premised on the kind of restless individualism that is the source of his of, of his anthro broader broader anthropology. Uh, Hobbes wasn't alone, obviously, in thinking that, and he didn't he didn't dream it up purely out of out of whole cloth. Uh, there are other important figures and movements of around the same time that are wrestling with this idea. in In my book, as uh, a kind of proto modern in this respect. I used a, um, you probably looked at the, the, the chapter in Machiavelli and his, his play that I focused on, Mandragola, mm -hmm. which I talk, where I talk about the protean self, uh, Hobbes' sort of creation of this idea of the many-sided individual who's sort of infinitely adaptive to new situations, is not going to be tied down, is restless and adaptive. Uh, Machiavelli gives some voice to that. Uh, at the same time of, of Hobbes, of course, Puritans uh, in theology have an idea of, uh, also an idea of the individual sort of uh, alone and uh, alone before God, uh, stand, standing almost naked, as it were, before, before God. But Hobbes is the one who I think takes this idea of individuality, individualism, and sort of presses it to its limits, and particularly for politics, brings out the uh, powerful uh, kind of political implications of that. And I think so many of the, the later 17th, 18th century thinkers are in all different ways wrestling. Locke, Rousseau, so many others wrestling Montesquieu with the problems that uh, Hobbes had, had created for them. A couple of weeks ago, we had an interview with, with uh, Patrick Denin, who wrote uh, okay. his, with his book about the failure of liberalism. Mm -hmm. and, and he kind of puts Hobbes more in kind of a non-liberal camp. But I think you make a little bit of a more nuanced argument that kind of Hobbes, of course, has this idea of the powerful state of the Leviathan. But when it comes to the individual, there, there is a, a, a liberal streak or especially an emphasis on, on the right to a private sphere so that, that Hobbes is not really... An authoritarian. I think this, it's much more nuanced. How would you describe Hobbes' position in this uh, regard? In, in, in important respects, Hobbes is not a liberal in, in the way we think of liberalism. Uh, separation of powers, limited government, uh, toleration, and, and so on. Uh, but in the more important respects, I don't liberalism. I, later liberalism, I think, would not have been possible without Hobbes. Hobbes makes the crucial moves uh, that makes subsequent liberal political philosophy possible. Partly, it's based on his philosophy of individualism and the way in which uh, society has to be understood as a con construction, a contract. Uh, that legitimate authority derives from the consent in some ways of the governed. Uh, consent plays a minimal but still important role in Hobbes, given much more uh, developed expression in Locke, and that it is the purpose of politics, uh, and this I think is crucial, the crucial link between Hobbes and liberalism. Uh, it's the business of politics not to save our souls. It's not concerned with what George Will called many years ago soul craft. Uh, politics is about attending to the business of stability, peace, and civil civil freedom in in this world. And that's it, it it's limited it, it, the business of politics is in a way quite limited. And in that way, even though Hobbes was an authoritarian uh, he created the, the grounds on which uh, I think limited government, understanding that the purpose of government was not all encompassing, but it was con concerned with the questions of order and a kind of ordered liberty that made the liberalism of Locke and, and, and the others 
later on possible. So uh, we might think of Hobbes as a sort of uh, proto-liberal or a kind of grandfather of liberalism or some, something like that, I would say. Is it a justified statement to say that, that with Hobbes might lay at the root of, of then later modern liberalism, but that his emphasis on the individual and the idea that the community serves the interest of the individual, the protection of the right and the protection of the life of the individual, that this is also a beginning of then the discontent with modernity because it, it has a lower place for community, it has, has kind of a lower place for the social feelings and the sociability of human beings. Absolutely. I mean, I, I completely agree with that. The uh, development of these kinds of views are also right at, at the root of what m many people later on are going to see uh, or complain about what, what, is, what is precisely the problem with With, moder with modernity. I, I couldn't agree more. Because there's an interesting conundrum. Uh, Dieter McCloskey, the economic historian, uh, wrote mm -hmm. recently a, a three-volume book, and I think the first volume is currently in, in the works, about the bourgeois. Oh. And it's very optimistic, very positive about the bourgeois. And there was one striking part where she makes the argument that the idea that modernity is kind of throwing us back to ourselves, a little bit the Tocquevillian argument that it makes us more lonely and, and doesn't allow mm -hmm. us to be part of authentic communities, she says it's exactly the opposite. Her argument is we are so free, we can join so many communities, and basically how are we to judge whether or not these communities are authentic or not? But could that be the problem, that kind of, that, that since we have These, this wide array of choices and we can enter communities, we can leave communities, that it's a commitment that can be entered and left so easily, that that, that is at the root of the cause, uh, that is at the root of what we would call a lack of authenticity and therefore also yeah. part of the, the problem with modernity. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would say it's, it's at the root of the problem, but it does, it does uh, pose an interesting, I think, paradox about modernity because we, uh, one of the things we, we all appreciate about what it is to be modern men and women is precisely the, the freedom of choice, the freedom to choose, uh, the freedom to make our own way in life. Uh, you know, choice is such a big uh, term also in economics and uh, market, market society to have, have choice over different uh, products and different, different goods and services and, and, and what is a marketplace, but sort of just a, a collection of cho choices. And yet at the same time, as you point out, it is uh, in a way almost the tyranny of, of those choices that, that, makes, that makes for so much unhappiness. We, we sort of, you know, faced with a limitless number of choices that we can pick, we can do this or do that, we can join this group or that group as easily as anything. Uh, that, 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 that leaves us, that leaves us with a kind of sense of, uh, uh, uh being adrift, being adrift in the, kind of morally adrift in the world, uh, with, without a place and with, without a home. And I think so much of this, uh, the discontent of, of, that people feel about modernity, and I, I get this very much in Patrick Deneen, you mentioned Patrick Deneen, I, I, I sense this very much in his book is this idea that uh, liberalism, and which he sort of associates with modernity, liberalism and modernity don't, don't, don't really provide us with a sense of home, a sense of place. Uh, I, just, I mean, I, the, the whole kind of communitarian turn in, in modern, in, in a lot of contemporary thought, I, I understand that. I think it's a, it speaks to a genuine need Uh, of human beings and a need to belong, a need, a need for a home and a place. Um, Hegel, I mean, I think of Hegel would be an example of someone like this who begins by arguing that uh, the purpose of philosophy, he says, is to make us feel at home in the world. To Hausa, he said, we want to be at home in the world. It's an admirable, or it's, it's, an, it's an understandable, I wouldn't know if it's admirable, but it's an understandable moral sentiment. And yet it is often taken by critics, and in some ways critics of both the left and the right, but more notably the right, uh, is the basis to launch a kind of furious rejection of modernity 
is producing an anti-culture, an anti-home, an anti-society, an anti-community, to reject root and to, to attempt to reject root and branch everything that modernity has done, because it is not a world with settled orders where there's a place for everybody and everybody has their place. Uh, that's part of that's part of the project. That was part of the project from the beginning. And it's a part that I don't want to give up on. I, I understand the reasons for the critique and up to a point even share some of them. But I don't want to take this in the direction of a kind of what I think of as furious denunciation and negation. Do you think that a little bit of the dilemma of, of modernity and, and it's, it's beginning with the Enlightenment is that on the one hand, the Enlightenment gave us all the tools necessary to, to really create uh, economic wealth, kind of the, 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 the scientific approach, the kind of, kind of the, the experimental approach, this idea that, you know, that things need to be tested and proven. So it really kind of laid the ground with rationality to, to allow for economic growth, to allow for economic prosperity. But at the same time, something that also Weber then talks about, it takes something away and that maybe this, this hole that is left by economic efficiency, that this, this is bigger than, than maybe we have anticipated. I think it is bigger than, than many of the early, earlier advocates of the commercial society and of the enlightened, enlightened society uh, expected, partly because they were They were fighting a somewhat different battle than we were. They were fighting a world of entrenched orders. They were fighting a world where, uh, in many places, uh, religion was a kind of dominant uh, principle and ordering mode of society. Uh, they were fighting a struggle against sort of the, in politics, against the domination of throne and altar. Uh, why? In the, in the name of a society that would be more attentive to the needs of the individual, that would be less um, present in every, every aspect of individual life. Uh, so they weren't concerned necessarily. The, the problems we've been talking about here, the problems of uh, restlessness, the problems of lack of community, the lack, the problems of kind of social, the social breakdown of mores and uh, local uh, community standards and this sort of thing. Uh, that just was not part of their struggle. They didn't for predict that as, as being a problem. But that is, that is the problem that we, that uh, in many ways has been created, not because of the failures of the Enlightenment, but quite the opposite, because of its very success. The very success of the Enlightenment and of, the, of, the, of modernity has created the problems that we now struggle with. And that was, that was part of my, my book, to bring out this kind of, uh, uh, to use an expression that's been used before, that was part of the dialectic of enlightenment that was, uh, that was created, that uh, the very success of modernity has produced its own, uh, its own negation. I think you, you, there's one chapter in the book about Flaubert's Madame Bovary, where you very mm -hmm. nicely described this. Could you just give us a short summary why you, why you picked uh, Flaubert for, for this example? Uh, thanks for asking me that question. Uh, the Flaubert chapter was one of my favorites to write, uh, although probably if you asked me about any chapter, I would say well, that was one of my favorites to write too. But I, I especially like Flaubert. It's a book I've read on and off for many years. I've taught it several times in classes. Uh, it brings into relief uh, the problem of the bourgeois in a vivid way, in a way, in a way that's more vivid almost than any work of philosophy or political theory could do. Uh, where, he where he looks at the problem, confronts the problem of how it is uh, that a sensitive and somewhat misdirected soul like Emma uh, faces and confronts uh, a world of, of a world that is in many ways the product of the post-French Revolutionary period, uh, that is the product of the bourgeois of the new bourgeois order, that is whose whose highest representative 
uh, is the town apothecary Omey, uh, Omey, the man who was a relentless sort of propagandist for, for science, for, uh, for uh, public health. He is a, he's an advocate of uh, you know, health care plans. He's a, he's a pharmacist and, uh, he, who is a, again, relentless believer in progress and, and the, the benefit. He, and he's also, he's also on, on, on top of that, fanatically anti-religious. He's, uh, he and the town priest are constantly at, at war with one another, sort of reproducing at a very low level the kind of great struggle between philosophy and religion, you know, of the of the of the, or of the early of the earlier period, and it's this it's this world that poor Emma is inhabiting, uh, rep- represented not by Homé but by her her bumbling uh, husband, who's also a kind of low grade scientist. He's a he's a doctor, uh, not quite a doc. He's not quite a doctor. He's a uh, He's like a physician, almost what we would call today maybe a physician's assistant, something like something like that. And uh, how she looks for alternatives, uh, de- you know, each one in, in in eros and love and eroticism and books and all kinds of all kinds of ways and consumerism. Uh, and of course, the result is is terrible and tragic and so on. But I thought that. Flaubert understood this world, our world, in a in a vivid way by highlighting at a very microscopic level, taking you know one individual, one life of Emma, and showing her, uh, presenting her as in many ways a uh, kind of rebel. Uh, one of the things I always liked about the book and about Emma, why why it stands out, she's she's a rebel. Uh, she's kind of a rebel without a cause in in some ways. But uh, her rebellion against this world that she has been, she's married into, and now seems just inescapable to her, a kind of iron cage of inescapability. This Flaubert so much represented, I think, so vividly the uh, problem that I was trying to uh, examine. His his take on it uh, was, was not particularly a political one at all. There's not a political alternative or a political philosophy in Flaubert. I'm not trying to argue such a thing. In many ways, his response was purely aesthetic, uh, that the, the alternative to the what he regarded as the ugliness and stupidity of bourgeois life was, was in fact art, and art, art for art's sake becomes, you know, the kind of label that we that sort of attach to his, his philosophy, uh, sort of aestheticism as a response uh, it's an, unsatisf- an unsatisfying response, I think. But I did, I do think, since you asked about the Flaubert chapter, I liked the way that I think Flaubert grapples with this question with a kind of directness and vividness that uh, that I loved. I mean, it it was. I think it's also one of the most pleasant chapters in the book. And what <laughs> what I enjoyed so much about it, it kind of, and I hope this is not overstepping, but it kind of reminded me a little bit of Tolstoy's uh, Anna Karenina in 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 the uh-huh. senses. They're different. We also talked to Gary Saul Morrison, who is who is more critical of of the French writers compared to the Russian ones. But I think what it becomes clear that from France to Russia, these authors work grappling with the question of modernity. So this this is not you know sometimes that people say well now we kind of read this into the past. We say there was this this grappling with modernity that never was there. But I think especially writers like Flaubert, Flaubert like Tolstoy, like Dostoevsky, they showed this this was really a struggle. They were really struggling aesthetically and philosophically with the question of modernity and what it meant for human life. Uh, I couldn't agree more. No, that's very right. Sounds very true to me. Because this brings me to, if I may, an almost a little bit of a more provocative question, Mm -hmm. which is, if we then look at, at, at modernity in the early 20th century, especially after World War One, would it be, and I say this with all carefulness, but would mm-hmm. it be a, a fair assessment that, that fascism and communism kind of were movements that said we take the, the technological modernity, we, we take the production mm-hmm. processes, we take the, the economics, we take the science, but we do not take kind of what it means for the individual. We don't take kind of the philosophical underpinning. So the state mm-hmm. is organic. It's a, we, we, we get rid of religion, we kind of replace it with the organic state or the, the classless society. So they, they, they tried to, 
that it was in a sense an attempt at an answer. This is not a defense, to be very clear, but that it was an attempt to answer this challenge of modernity with liberation of the individual, protection of the individual, but at the same time kind of having that the, the, the sum is more than just the, the addition of its pieces, that the whole is more than the sum of its pieces. That it was an, an attempt to grapple with the question of modernity. I, I definitely think that's right. Uh, certainly movements like communism and fascism thought of themselves as more advanced forms of modernity that would in many ways, as you put it, I think very nicely, use a lot of the tools that modernity had created, particularly in terms of science and technology, but move them beyond uh, the kind of alienating uh, structures of moral and political life that the liberalism had had failed had failed to adopt or failed failed to answer in some ways. So fascism, in particular, I think, is connected to this sort of desire or this danger we've been talking about of rootlessness and trying to create a kind of organic community or recreate some notion of an organic community in which people are. Are, are members and 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 and, and uh, part of a, a whole of which of which they are a part. Uh, <clears throat> communism, in its own way, I think, also a, attempting to do this. The, the language of home and homeland not being particularly important for communism, but the idea of a kind of international brotherhood of workers creating a workers' state and a workers' international of some kind. Uh, these all seem to be connected to. Uh, the idea of creating a form of fraternity, in a way, if you want to use that kind of French revolutionary slogan uh, for this, this fraternity that, that liberalism uh, didn't, frankly, uh, think enough about, perhaps. Uh, if we take the famous trio of liberty, what is it, liberty, equality, and fraternity, uh, liberalism has done well in thinking, in thinking about the first two of those, liberty and equality. It, has, it hasn't given much thought to the problem of fraternity. And I think that's where uh, these ideologies, uh, very anti-liberal ideologies like liberalism, I mean, excuse me, like um, communism, fascism, and certain contemporary offshoots of both of them uh, come in to fill the gap, trying to find some notion of, uh, of, 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 of community, of, of fraternity and the like. Uh, which is, called to my attention recently a uh, political theorist, uh, I forget the name now, but he's just written a book called The Comrade, trying to rehabilitate uh, what was widely thought to be a very discredited term, maybe only used for the most part ironically or in jest uh, because of its, of its association with communism, but trying to re rehabilitate the idea of the comrade as the a kind of central concept, guiding concept of what the new of a new political theory, and that, that seems also to speak to this idea that liberalism has not thought uh, as deeply as it should have about about the, these kinds of questions. I, I, don't, I don't think the comrade is the is, is the answer we're looking for, but it does seem to be an example of the of the problem that you have you've alluded to yeah is it we, we talked now extensively especially about your book modernity and it's it's this and it's this contents but mm -hmm. another book you wrote is about reading leo strauss and i think okay. leo strauss is probably one of the i mean i'm an austrian myself so of course as a kind of german speaking philosopher mm -hmm. i have a special affinity but mm -hmm. what makes, I think, Leo Strauss especially interesting, and, and in reading Leo Strauss, it's towards the end that you kind of go into this in more detail. Can you tell us a little bit about the relationship between the philosophy of Leo Strauss and the philosophy of, of Martin Heidegger? Because Heidegger kind of, as, as, as this, this well-known philosopher mm. that, that did embrace, to some extent, Justice Carl Schmitt, fascism and national socialism. Absolutely. And... Uh... Uh, I devoted a chapter in that book to that question of the relation of, of Heidegger and Strauss. Uh, I mean, just as a little biography on the question, Strauss had been uh, a socier, a kind of part of Heidegger. He spent a, Strauss spent a year uh, after, fin after finishing his doctoral degree, he, which I think was 1920, he finished the doctorate. 
Uh, he spent a year in Freiburg where he went to study with the famous phenomenological philosopher Husserl, who was, who was teaching there. And he went there and found himself vivid, you know, much more, found much more compelling uh, a young teaching assistant uh, or a lecturer named Heidegger. And uh, Heidegger had already by this time attracted uh, or was in the process of attracting a number of very uh, powerful and intellectual powerful intellectual figures of the time. Uh, Hans-Georg Gadamer was part of that world, and Karl Lervet, uh, uh, all people that Strauss would later uh, continue to correspond with and, and, and share, share his ideas with. Uh, Heidegger was, and Strauss wrote about this later, uh, not widely, but he did write about what a powerful presence Heidegger had been for him as a young man. Talked about returning to Frankfurt, no, excuse me, returning to Berlin, uh, because at that time I think he had uh, he had a position in Berlin, uh, and stopping off on the way at Frankfurt to visit his mentor Franz Rosenzweig, and telling Rosenzweig uh, that he found Heidegger absolutely uh, compelling and told Heidegger, uh, excuse me, told Rosenzweig that in comparison to his pre one of his previous great heroes, Max Weber, that Weber, he said, looked like an orphan child in comparison to Heidegger. Uh, Strauss didn't write about Heidegger a great deal, uh, very, very little directly about Heidegger. Um, but I, I think that the influence of Heidegger was, was palpable on, on so many things that he wrote. And his work, in some ways, you could maybe this is an exaggeration, but I think it does bring out something about Strauss's work. Strauss uh, thought of himself as trying to provide an alternative to, to Heidegger. If you take Strauss's most, probably his best known work, natural, called Natural Right and History, uh, published originally in 1953, uh, it seems very clear just from the title alone, Natural Right and History, that it is in some sense modeled on, but also uh, an al presenting an alternative to being in time, he Heidegger's great work. So I do think uh, Natural Right and History is kind of modeled on, and again, a response to Heidegger, and he wants to show that there was something about Heidegger's philosophy of design and ex existentialism. Uh, that's a, a problem that Strauss himself, I don't think, ever adequately uh, explained or developed. Uh, many, many have tried since. But what was the connection between Heidegger's philosophy and his political commitments to National Socialism in 1933? And I think Strauss wanted to use political philosophy to defend liberal, liberal democracy. And that was part of Strauss's resistance to Heidegger. He saw that there was something very dangerous in Heidegger's thought, politically dangerous, powerful, and yet and dangerous. And his life's work, again, to maybe exaggerate a bit, but maybe just a bit, uh, was to provide a, a liberal alternative to, to Heideggerianism. Do you think one of the problems with liberal democracy and liberalism in general is that it doesn't require faith? And I don't mean like religious faith, but mm -hmm. many other belief systems kind of they require their followers to, to make a leap of faith, whether it's again, for mm -hmm. communism, it's, it's the class society, it's Marx, mm -hmm. the, 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 the teachings of Marx, for fascism, it's the idea of race and kind of this, this social Darwinistic approach. Mm -hmm. Liberalism's claim is one of, of rationality, right? That liberalism does, yeah. You don't have to believe in liberalism. You don't have to, to, to worship at the altar of liberalism. We are just, by matter of fact, the best possible system or the most rational system. And then people feel, well, th there, is, there is nothing emotionally rewarding by being part of a liberal democracy, right? It's, it's not a struggle. It's, it's, it's not that you don't sacrifice. And it almost feels with the lack of, of sacrifice and faith in the system, people don't take as much pride as being part of it. It's, it's kind of what we see in all religions, like there's fasting and there is, there is, there is all these kind of things so that people need to sacrifice something to demonstrate their loyalty to, to whatever their faith is. And, and liberal democracy doesn't ask that of us. 
And what seems on the one hand as a strength, it, it also seems a little bit as a potential weakness. I think there's something to what you say. Uh, in many ways, liberal democracy arguably makes much greater demands on people than other other kinds of political commitments. Why? Because you, for the reason you just said, because it demands our reason. It demands our thinking and reflection. Uh, it doesn't just demand a leap of faith or a kind of commitment. It doesn't demand just commitment or faith or some of these uh, irrational or non-rational factors. Uh, it does seem to demand a kind of rational, rationalist rationalism uh, that that the citizen is a free and rational being who who can come to certain truths or come to certain understandings through their own reason, and that's a that's a high demand. And for some people, it may be <clears throat> thought to be <clears throat> excuse me lacking in exactly the kind of uh, passion and the kind of passionate commitment. Uh, that you have uh, very, very nicely uh, put. You know, there's a famous uh, statement by the poet Robert Frost, who defined a liberal as someone who's enabled, un incapable of taking their own side yes. in an argument. Uh, it's a kind of caricature of a certain, certain kind of liberalism. Although, like every caricature, it may it may have a certain degree of truth to it. Uh, liberalism prides itself on on open-mindedness and toleration and these, these virtues, but those are, those are very demanding virtues. We think of toleration as being lazy somehow, not accepting truth. I, I've always thought the opposite. It's very demanding virtue to be, to be tolerant of other people and other ideas with whom, with which you may fundamentally disagree. Uh, is a very demanding moral uh, quality. Um, does, I had a student uh, a couple of years ago uh, who had an argument uh, about liberalism very much of, in the way that you, uh, you put it, and the way he would put it, the way he would put it is he says, liberalism doesn't give me any reason to get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, doesn't I, I don't feel some compelling uh, passion to uh, to support it, it doesn't. It's, it's too watery. It was too watery for him. He needed he needed more uh, passion uh, about it. And yet, uh, what what would if, if if defending democracy isn't passion enough for you? I mean, I, 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 this is what I the way I would put it. Uh, if defending democracy isn't enough for you, what more do you need? Uh, so I I want to argue against the people who say that liberalism uh, is anemic, it's weak, it's just uh, kind of too relativistic and watery. Uh, I, I think, uh, it, may, it maybe it's true for some people, but I think that uh, liberalism is also a fighting creed. And if, again, democracy is not enough, what, what, more, what more do you want, what more do you expect politics to do? Is this a little bit what happened in recent years, that that we we see a little bit of, of of emerging between between politics and what once was religion in in a sense mm -hmm. that, that that we look for more in politics than it is supposed to give us. Yeah, and, and and that's, that's a, so true. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, we're getting. Uh, hello. Hello. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Hi. Okay. Here we are. Okay. <laughs> So that, that, that kind of, it's no longer the, the idea that, that the state is no longer an, an, an extension, so to speak, in order to provide goods and services and individual protections. Mm -hmm. It also becomes a, almost a sounding board for emotional desires. It's kind of, mm -hmm. the, the poli politics has become, I, I'm exaggerating slightly for a dramatic effect, but it, it has become an ersatz religion, I feel, in, in, in some areas. I think that's right. And, you know, if you look at, University campuses, and you know, I think the 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 revival of interest in someone like Carl Schmidt, uh, who you would have thought of, would have never had any hearing at all. I think part of it it has to do with Schmidt's attempt to turn politics into a kind of spiritual struggle of us and them. It's a, it becomes much more a kind of spiritualized combat uh, to inject politics with with right this sense of. Uh, 
redemption, redemptive mission, uh, purpose, higher, higher purpose, and, and, and the like, uh, the new nationalism uh, that we've been reading so much about, hearing a lot about, that's trying to, once again, give politics some of the, uh, some of the same uh, qualities that, right, that used to be associated with religion, with its redemptivist uh, language and its attempt to present uh, what should just be sort of the give and take of, of, of normal uh, political life, to give it some kind of deep or higher spiritual meaning. Uh, once again, I, I feel I understand the impulse, but it's a, it's a very dangerous one. And I think one, one that we tinker with at our, at our peril. There are kind of two strands in the argument that, that I would like to try to, to put together. One is what you, okay. said, what you said before, which I agree, right? I mean, if defending liberal democracy and defending liberalism should be enough or should give one a reason to get up in the morning. Yeah. But you also said there is this, this, this symptom. So that exactly, I think the new nationalism is a very good example for this. this, this these old desires are still there. But I think without talking about the content, just in the way it is communicated, but I think you also see it slightly in discussions about the environment. To be very clear, I'm not an environmental specialist, so, so I, I can't say that much about the content. But as you see it in the communication, kind of when the arguments are, well, then democracy has to be suspended until the, the problem is solved. And, and mm -hmm. this is something democracy cannot deal with. We need, as in, in Austria, the, the discussion is a state of emergency must be declared. And for me, this mm -hmm. sounds more than just a little bit Schmidtian. This, this is an emergency. We don't know that much about it, but we all agree that it needs to be a state of emergency. That's, I feel that that goes a little bit in this, into this direction. That also has this this also more. Finally, there is a challenge we, we we can get together to overcome that takes us out of the boredom of daily life. Again, I'm exaggerating here, but I think that, that, no, that I think the I think the exaggeration is is on is on target. I think you you sister the boredom of daily life, and I think I I think there is something about. Uh, Schmitty and uh, kind of higher politics, uh, it, it rebels against uh, what is seen as the routinization of, nor of normal politics that's boring, that uh, that's just has to do with interests and interest groups and, uh, you know, sort of b boring bourgeois parliamentary, parliamentary democracy. What we want is, cr what, what, we, what we want and what we thrive on are moments of crisis, of existential crisis, things that uh, things that pose a kind of existential challenge to the very life of, 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 of the community and uh, or of society or, or even of the world if you want to think of climate change or climate catastrophe as one such example. So it's a way, it is a form of mobilizing for some higher cause and um, that uh, always, always I think something uh, when, whenever I hear that kind of talk, uh, it's, and it really is part of the discontent with modernity, uh, although re presenting itself as, as a higher and nobler form of modernity, uh, I, I become very, very skeptical. And this is kind of where I because I, I, because possibly because I'm a, I'm a kind of a bourgeois liberal at heart. Me too, but I think once one knows that one is one, it's easier to defend. <laughs> because yeah, well, that, that's true. That's true. Once you know where you are, it's easier to defend, right? And this this is one of one of the essays by, by Leo Strauss that, that I very much enjoyed, and, and I mentioned this to you once, was his, his article about German nihilism. And, mm. and what I found particularly striking about Strauss's argument, for him it's, oh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but it seems to me, for him it's not the nihilism itself that is the problem. It is that, that those who, who use violent means or radical means to kind of revolt against the nihilism, those who, who supposedly should stand up against them, don't feel that they kind of have the, the, the justification or, or the courage or, 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 or a reason to, to stand up against them. Mm -hmm. I think he kind of describes this that when communism and fascism came up in the Weimar Republic, people knew what they were, like people knew what, what they were doing, but the center, so to speak, did not hold because there was not the yeah. inner conviction of, of the bourgeois at the time or of, of, of the people that saw what was going on at the time to stand up against the threat. And it seems to me that this is what he means by nihilism. 
Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's a, a good reading of the of the essay. Uh, I'll just I'll just add a, a word or two uh, about it because it's a, it's an essay I've gone back to a number of occasions. Uh, was not published by Strauss during his lifetime. Uh, it was found in his archive. It was given as a seminar paper that when he was teaching at the New School in the early 40s. Um, and one of the things that had always struck me uh, very vividly about that essay on German nihilism is in many ways a kind of sympathetic treatment of what these young uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche he associates German nihilism, going back to Nietzsche, he thinks of Nietzsche as the source of, of so much of this. Uh, he, he says they had a moral cause he would, with which he wasn't altogether, with, with which he wasn't, which he was not unsympathetic. And it, it clearly gives you the impression that Strauss was thinking about himself in, in the 1920s. He was one of, he was one of those young German nihilists, as he calls them later, uh, discontent with the culture of Weimar and kind of the culture of uh, what, what would be the culture of German democracy. And was, again, he was attracted early on he was, to Heidegger, he was lifelong fascination with Nietzsche. He, under, he understood very powerfully the critique of liberalism and the Enlightenment, very, very powerfully. But I think by the 40s, if not earlier, he also came to see what was so, so fundamentally dangerous uh, about this as well. And the German nihilism essay, I think, is in many ways a kind of coming to terms with his younger self and trying to uh, stake out a new territory, a new direction for, for his thinking that would, uh, again, be something of an alternative to the Schmittian, Nietzschean, Heideggerian philosophy that had been so much a part of his, of his, early, of his early life. You mentioned Strauss's work, Natural Rights and History, which uh, also for our listeners, I think what makes Strauss so interesting, he's actually, his, his writing style is very accessible. I think that also distinguishes him from, from, from other authors. So, so Strauss mm -hmm. is not, he seems to me, he's not such a convoluted writer. So even for, for younger listeners, mm -hmm. I, I would recommend them to pick up Strauss mm -hmm. because if one takes the time, he's, he's actually a very, a very clear writer. I want to take this occasion kind of to circle all the way back to Hobbes. Mm. Isn't that a little bit the issue? Kind of, with all that Hobbes developed, kind of, and, and, and Hobbes' idea of society and the individual, that, and this is again a little bit of, of a purposefully provocative statement, that Hobbes tries to take morality out of the question, right? You have in, in um, modernity and its discontents, you have this great piece on Hobbes you describe, and Hobbes says, well, even if the state compels you to deny your religion, you shouldn't really care about it because you pray with your heart and not with your tongue. So yes. if the state says uh -huh. you have to be a Catholic, but deep down you're Protestant, don't worry about it. Kind of God looks into your heart and not into your tongue. Better to obey the state and maintain order and peace than to, you know, sacrifice yourself or risk you and your family's life by insisting on, sure. on, on, your, on your specific religion. So he's, Hobbes is almost the, the, the anti-Nietzsche in a sense, or the, the anti-Schopenhauer. Hobbes does not say struggle more. He says whenever possible, you know, avoid the struggle and, and maintain your individual physical integrity. And, and everything else is, 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 is commentary to, I exaggerate here a little bit. No, I think I, I like that thought. Uh, I'd make one, uh, how to say, one adjustment to it, perhaps. Uh, certainly much of Hobbes's writing is directed against the dangers that uh, previous religious and ethical doctrines uh, may presented and presented them also as causes of war and conflict and Hobbes wants to celebrate you know uh, life on this earth uh, that we're, we're that, that life is all there is and uh, we're not living here to get to to get to the afterlife this is all there is and then if that if that's the case then we have to create a society and a kind of politics that is more 
appropriate to people whose whose entire existence is is bounded by their worldly worldly being and well being. And yet within that within that sort of materialist frame of reference, and this, the expression Hob, Strauss always used for that was that the way how the moderns like Machiavelli and and Hobbes, the, he, he talked about a lowering of the sights of, of ancient philosophy. They, they, they looked lower, they lowered, they lowered the, the perspective, bringing it entirely down to earth. And yet even within that, Hobbes wanted to create uh, a sense of morality, and it may be a new morality, a moral life, uh, that would be, uh, that was not entirely or put it another way, he wanted to create a, a vision of society and politics that was not void of morality and moral life. And for him, the, the center of, lot of morality is the value of life itself. Uh, life itself is a, something of infinite worth and infinite value. That seems a strange statement for someone who's usually thought of as materialistic and as tough-minded as Hobbes. But I do think Hobbes was in, was in many ways a moralist who emphasized the centrality of life and the things necessary to uh, preserve and, and protect protect hum, human life. Uh, and that may not be uh, in every respect uh, an elevating and an inspiring moral code, but it is a, a decent and and and. and uh, and, and, a, and a moderate one. And maybe that's also connected with Hobbes' liberalism. Uh, it's not that it's immoral or amoral. He, he does have a morality, but it's, it's a morality that's based on, I think its first principle is that life is something to be protected and respected. And if we accept that premise, the politics and so on seem to be followed from that. Well, on that note, I'm not going to lie, I could uh, continue this conversation uh -huh. for another hour. But okay. I'll... Oh, we've been at it an hour already? Yes, we have. <laughs> oh my God, the time has just, has just flown. Yeah, wow. Okay, no, this, I had no idea. This, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. This was, uh, this was, was exactly and, and, and more than I expected. So uh, I'm very glad we could do this. And uh, may I announce immediately, Whenever the next article or book uh, from you comes out, rest assured, I'll get back in touch with you and hope that we can have another conversation. I, I would love to. I've, I've actually just finished a book on patriotism, so that would be a great topic for conversation. Oh, yes, absolutely. In the future. Okay, well, Ralph, it was my pleasure, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Have a good day. Bye. I hope so. Bye-bye.